step A, yeah. <laughs> choose a hot celebrity. Right. <laughs> step B, take a picture of said hot celebrity drinking your beer. Right. Step three, ah. Welcome to the Settlers of Soul podcast. I'm your host, Aria Stair. I'm really excited about this episode. We're speaking with Tiffany Needham today, a founder of the Magpie Brewing Company that has been a staple destination for Koreans and the international community here in Seoul. We touch on the craft beer industry here in the country, brewing and distribution, what it's like working at Magpie, how the idea got started, just a bunch of stuff about the craft beer business here in Korea. I found fascinating. I'm sure you will too. I think Magpie is building something really special here in Seoul, and it was a real treat to learn about it. As always, if you like the show, please do subscribe and rate us on iTunes. It's the fastest way to help grow our audience. And do check out the website, www.settlersofsoul.com, for show notes, links, and bios. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, Tiffany. Welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. So uh, Magpie Brewery is kind of a staple of the international community. Um, it's, it's where I go just about every Friday night. Um, I was hoping you could actually share with us how did you first start the business? Um, there's lots of different sulchips and, and, and breweries around, but specifically you and, and, and what was the catalyst for starting Magpie? We started Magpie mainly because we wanted some diversity in, in beers. My partner and um, now husband, Eric, uh, Jason, and I started homebrewing together because we really wanted something to drink that was other than a pale lager. We had been back home and the craft beer revolution was really just starting in the States. And every time we go home, there's just so much there. And when we come back to Korea, we'd really miss um, having options. So we started homebrewing. We were really into making things ourselves, very DIY. And with Jason, we wanted to make more and more beer because we drink it really quickly. So we ended up bringing in two of our other friends, Huss and Suji, to invest and uh, put together some money to start uh, brewing more and uh, getting a location to brew. Um, eventually, we planned to turn that into a business, but it just all started as home brewing. So you started, you were you were brewing in an apartment here in Korea? Yeah, we were brewing in Jason's apartment, um, and that got pretty sweaty because you have to boil for <laughs> quite a right, while, right. and so that got pretty sweaty pretty quickly. Uh, we moved into an, an artist studio. I don't know if you know, there's a restaurant called Dandy Pink, and the owner is an artist, and he let us move into his artist studio, and that also didn't have enough ventilation. There were mushrooms growing out of the walls. Like, it was just madness. So we ended up finding a a spot in our neighborhood, which is between Hebangchon and Gyeongnidan. And it was a little restaurant that wanted to move out. And so we got it. And we were brewing there for about six months before we opened. Yeah. And that's the same spot where Magpie <coughs> is now. Yeah, that's our first location. How did you find that location? You said that there was a restaurant uh, that was available, but uh, in a previous uh, discussion that we had had, there was actually kind of a funny story behind that. Yeah, we were looking for a space, and um, one of our friends who owns Standing Coffee, which is a local coffee place, he he was able to recommend. He's like, hey, I know this this older couple. They're thinking about getting out of the neighborhood. They really just do food deliveries, and so they don't, they don't need their location. And so we went to visit them, and... Um, yeah, the, they were looking to get out and they wanted to hand the spot over to someone. So we took it over. But it was um, it was definitely lucky to have that contact to introduce us. Yeah, and that was it. I don't, I don't remember the funny story. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. The funny part is Standing Coffee is connected to Magpie, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we're still good friends with them. I think that's part of the charming aspect of living in an expat neighborhood. Well, actually... Uh, the owner of Standing Coffee is Korean, but he spoke English and he was just really integrated into the community. And I think that we were as well. We didn't do much outside of Itaewon. It was our our whole community and support system. And so, you know, getting our feet on the ground and starting Magpie was really important that everybody in Itaewon really supported us, I think. So there are five original founders. Yes. And they're all foreigners? Yes. What yeah. kind of challenges comes with that. Um, I mean, five foreigners go into this old, you know, Ajima restaurant and says, we want to buy this place from you. Yeah. Right. How did they react? And also, how did the community react? Because you came in, I guess, 2011 was when you were scouting out this location. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, you know, Nook Sapyang had not yet, you know, kind of turned into uh, what it is now. Yeah. Um, what kind of obstacles did you face? Or maybe not obstacles, but what kind of uh, experience was that? I think the Koreans 
were really open to foreigners because the army base had been there for so long. And so there was, there is a strong foreign community there. And it wasn't a, a surprising thing for us to come in and say, Hey, we'd like to have this space. Um, the owners weren't amazed that we were foreigners. So out of the five of us, Hassan speaks Korean fluently. Suji does as well. She's Korean Kyopo. So she was born in the States and then lived in Korea for a little bit. Um, I'm half Korean. So I think that the ties there made it quite easy and um, easy for us to communicate as well as culturally integrate. I think um, it it also helped us with starting the business in terms of the biz- getting the business license and all of that. I was... I got the first business license because I could do that very easily, and then we switched over to a corporate license later. Was it difficult getting a business license for a, uh, I guess, I, I don't know, what, what did you file yourself as? As a brewery, as a restaurant that serves alcohol? Yeah, so we started as just a restaurant that serves alcohol. Um, it's like an Ilban Shikdang, so that's a general restaurant. It was started as a sole proprietor, so it was just under my name for about the first year. And then when we expanded to the basement, we switched over to a corporate license. Was that tough? I mean, what's it it like filing a business license here? I mean, my understanding is that it's actually pretty quick. The entry entry barriers to these things are pretty low, and that kind of leads into high turnover in these other industries. But let's say from the moment you had the idea to actually having the business license in hand, how long did that take? Probably about six months. Well, okay, so having the idea, getting into our location – and then the business license really once we decided, okay, we're going to make this a business. We're going to, we have a viable product. We have like a couple recipes. Like, and then we were also working with Ka Brew in Gapyong to start contract brewing with them because we didn't have a brewery. That all got sought, got set up and we were getting the business license in April. The business license itself was really easy to get. I just went to the tax office and began some of the collecting some of the paperwork they needed. And then once I filed, I think it about took about a week or two to pick it up. Wow, that's and that's great. it. Yeah. And the, actually, the guy at the tax office, he was so nice. He, they have an English section for English speakers and he was so nice and maybe a little bit bored. And so he just expedited everything for me and he, he really helped to push everything through and get it done quickly. Yeah. When craft brewing was still your hobby, uh, what beers did you decide to launch with? We wanted hoppy beers. So we wanted to do a pale ale, an IPA. Um, We wanted to do a porter. Um, Anything like a Kolsch is a little bit harder because you need to be able to uh, ferment it at a cooler temperature. Um, So we really were sticking with ales that were hoppier, had a lot of flavor, and that we could make at the warmer temperatures. Was this because this is just something that was your personal preference, or did you see that there was a market opportunity for these? It started as personal preference. You know, when you go back home and you can have a pale ale that's super hoppy or um, like a West Coast style pale ale, that didn't exist in Korea at all. So it's kind of what we craved. It's what we wanted to drink. And then we started throwing, we would make too much beer, too much homebrew. And we'd throw these beer parties and people would come out and drink. And the response was amazing. So we knew that we had um, a product that people would like, especially at a couple of the events. Korean homebrewers would come out, and that was a big sign for us. We didn't want to cater to just foreigners. You know, I think our target has always been a Korean audience because we plan on being in Korea long term, and that's, uh, yeah, that's where we should be focusing. Yeah, so I, I was reading you know, in, pre- in preparing for this interview that, you know, there was kind of a policy shift in 2014 that has really, uh, I guess, opened up the floodgates for microbrewers have all seen. Craft beer scene is is just really, really big now. Um, Could you actually walk us through what it was like when you first started uh, and and how that is now in 2017? Do you feel that it's more competitive? Do you feel that it's been diluted where the quality has actually gone down? Um, Talk about the industry a little bit. Yeah. The thing that allowed us to get started was in 2012, there was a law change. Essentially, you had either a brew pub or you had a mega brewery. Mega breweries could distribute, they could can. Mega and, brewery would be like OB yeah, height. Exactly. Yeah. Like the big boys. And they could distribute, which was the main difference. A brew pub, you could only sell on premises. And in 2012, the license changed to allow brew pubs to 
um, distribute everywhere. Essentially, every every brewery could distribute. Was and, that the result of a of, of a, a lobbying effort? Uh, were you involved in that at all? We were not involved in that. That was. I think there was some lobbying. I remember that there was one um, legislator who really pushed this through and made this his personal agenda. I don't remember his name though, but it was it was big news for us when we when we heard about it. This means that we could start contract brewing with Cabru, Cabru um, with Park Chol. In Gapyong, he really is, I think, we call him like our, the grandfather of craft beer because um, he had a brew pub for a long time. And then he was probably the most open-minded person And when we talk about contract brewing and using his facility to make our beer. He was really open-minded to it and really willing to um, experiment and try different stuff. And um, his brewers were also really helpful in accommodating us and wanting to make our recipes for us. So they were key to getting started. In 2012, we started contract brewing with them. And then later, the 2014 change, I believe that created a medium-sized business. And so that has to do a lot with tax structure and what kind of tax breaks, tax breaks you get. So I guess after 2012, you start seeing a lot of a lot of these breweries start contract brewing for other people. And then you start seeing other small home brewers or people who wanted to get into brewing start contract brewing. We started with Cobrew, quickly maxed out their production. So contract brewing contract brewing is just you you go into somebody with the facilities and you yes. say, "Please here here's our recipes. Brew it like this." And then yes. they take some sort of percentage off the top based on quantity, based on a flat rate. I mean, you're saying that this is kind of a common common business model here yes, in Korea. Yes, that's right. It's common everywhere. Um, it started in the U.S. and it's pretty much to help breweries get started without having to put up all the all the um, upfront costs starting a brewery. So magpie beers are not, in fact, brewed in an apartment anymore. No, they're not. <laughs> Thank, thankfully, they're not. <laughs> they're not. And we have a professional brewer who makes things and there's no chance of infection and all that kind of stuff. So that's good. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So contract brewing is really common for uh, brewery, brewers and breweries to start brewing because, um, yeah, you don't have to put up the upfront cost to open a facility and you can just start brewing, see if you have a product, see if you have a brand that people will latch on to and, um, and grow it from there. It's also great for breweries because oftentimes they'll grow to where they have maybe too much um, – too much room and they need someone else to come in and start filling their tanks. So if you can find that, that partnership, then that's really good. And that's, we managed to find it with Copper until we maxed out their facility and they were also growing. So they didn't have any more production space for us. Um, so we ended up moving to Seven Broy. Seven Broy, I think we, rubbed heads a little bit because we really wanted to have our brewer in there working with them and making sure that our beers were made the way that we wanted them to. And they, you know, they were, they were a little bit more protective of their space and didn't want to have an outside brewer in. So we finally started working with the table in Ilsan. The table has been really great, with, great to us. They were lacking a head brewer. And so they, they wanted our head brewer to come in and start running their brewery. So that's what happened. Yeah. Our brewer came in, started making our beers, also helped them make their beers. And, um, yeah. And we worked with them until we moved out into our own brewery last year. Did it just hit a point where you were just producing and moving so much product that you decided that you wanted to keep it in the house? Uh, was it a similar situation like in Nuxapyeong where there was an opportunity and opening for some real estate that you thought that was was advantageous? We always wanted to have our own brewery. Um, it's the only way to actually control your product from beginning to end. It's the only way to grow the way that you want to grow. When we were contract brewing, we were always limited by what the brewery owner wanted to do, what their production schedule was like, and of course their growth comes before ours. So we always knew that we would have to move into our own house and have our own brewery. The decision was made, and we, we had been shopping for a partner for quite a while. We decided to go to Jeju and partner with Arario because they were also looking for someone to bring beer to Jeju. They wanted to have like a brew pub right next to one of their museums. Their Arario is a, um, is run by an art collector who also is an artist and they co- own quite a bit of property in Jeju and in Chonan area. So they were building a museum in Jeju and they wanted to have a brew pub next to it so that visitors could go afterwards and enjoy some food and drink. 
We said that was great, but um, we weren't really interested in a brew pub because we needed a bigger facility, especially if we were going to be making beer on an island and then sending it up north. Typhoons happen and you're shipping things. Right. And yeah, so um, we had to make sure that we had enough of a production facility to accommodate that. Talk about the logistics a little bit. Um, how much beer are you producing in a week? How, how quickly does that get from the brewery in Jeju to my glass at Noxapyong. Yeah, I mean, it takes about a day shipping, and it's all cold shipping. Um, we have a 15-barrel brew house, which is about 1,700 liters, about. I think it's a, like, if you round up, it's 1,800 uh, liters. And in a month, we make about 30,000 uh, liters of beer. Yeah, so that accommodates our... Itaewon, Hongdae, Jeju locations, yeah. And then we also do distribution. And distribution, it's hard. It's in the summertime now, and so that's really exploding. And to be able to control growth as well, because we have to make sure that it fits our production schedule is important. Is it flown in then? It's flown into Incheon? It's or uh, Gimbit, uh, by ocean. By yeah. ocean. So it goes onto a refrigerated container and then is shipped up. And they do shipments every day, every other day, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot easier than than expected. Like when we first got into this, we we're really intimidated by <laughs> by the fact that we had to ship the beer from Jeju, but it's actually really simple and it happens all, you know, every single day. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so it's good. And Arario has turned out to be the, a really great partner for us. And when we turned down the brew pub offer, we said, you know, we need a bigger facility, and they said, great, let's start talking about that. I think That's great. Ma- they, they wanted it to happen as much they as wanted it, you to wanted happen. it to happen. And I think one of the things that we also got lucky with is that um, because they deal, they're an artistic uh, company, they very much respect our decisions in terms of like what kind of beer we want to produce and all that kind of stuff. They don't interfere with any of that. They mainly provide the building and the land and helped us with getting the equipment. Yeah. What did you imagine Magpie becoming and Has that changed at all in the five, six years that you've been in business? When we first started, we wanted to be a distribution company mainly. We did not want to focus on uh, retail locations, opening restaurants and bars. We were going to have the one little location in Itaewon, the first floor brew shop, and mainly distribute. That did not end up happening. (laughs) We ended up um, moving down to the basement because... So for those that don't know, um, there is a basement level magpie, uh, which is in the building just right next door. Yes. Correct? That's yes. correct. Yeah, I feel like it's a really Korean setup to be like, oh, there's the same exact location downstairs, but next door. Um, anyway, we ended up growing our, um, our F&B side, our retail side, faster than we did our distribution for a couple of reasons. First, the distribution, other bars weren't ready. Um, I think the general public did not know enough about craft beer. Other bars were not willing to put in a refrigerator for your kegs. They used um, uh, bar top coolers or things like that. Um, the second thing is that you can educate the customer a, more directly when you're serving them directly. One of the things that we found was uh, a challenge, but also a lot of fun and really important was talking to the customer directly about what is our product, what goes into it, what is what makes craft beer special versus um, a cast or a height that they'll drink at the gogi chip down the street. And I think it really helped us to connect with an audience. It really helped us to figure out, okay, these are craft beer lovers. These, This is what other people do not know about craft beer. And so we can, t- we can tailor our service um, to teach them why they should like craft beer or at least not even like it, but just, you know, acknowledge that it's there, respect it, and hopefully enjoy it one day. I think we never wanted to change our product to match a palate. So it never occurred to us to say, oh, these all these Korean people are coming in. They don't like bitter beers. Maybe we should tone down the bitterness. We said, no, this is what we like. This is what we would want to drink every single day. Right. This is what we were brewing 10 years ago. This is what we like. Exactly. So this is what we should be Um, we just need to teach them or we just need to show them like why it's, why is it bitter? Um, you know, why that balances the flavor and maybe one day they'll appreciate it. And I think a lot of people were so curious. Um, they wanted to know about craft beer and how it's made. And, and you're not just talking about foreigners. You're actually talking about 
yeah, I'm talking about our, as well. Yeah, our our Korean customers. A lot of a lot of foreigners were already familiar with craft beer, and they wanted an IPA, and they missed they missed that from being in the states and whatnot. But what um, what is the split? <clears throat> is it like fifty percent Korean customers, forty percent? I mean, when when I go there, you know that that kind of space in between Uri Supa and Magpie. I mean, uh, yeah, it's kind of an international <laughs> little, yeah. little little place. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, is it majority of your customers are are international? The majority of our customers are Korean, um, and that's that's looking at the big picture in terms of all of our locations. Hongdae, Jeju. Yeah, all of our locations and distribution. The, the majority of it, I would say like 80% of our customers are Korean. Itaewon is really special because it is an international community, and so when you go there, especially that first floor, you'll see a lot of foreigners there. Um, and that's, you know, our community there is really foreigner-driven and strong. Um, but if you go into the basement, a lot of Korean customers want seating so they can sit with their friends and um, enjoy pizza together and that kind of thing. So you might see more Koreans in the basement because of the seating. Yeah. Has your basic menu changed a lot since you first opened the place? No, I wish it would. <laughs> I, wish, <laughs> I mean, I wish I wish that we could experiment more and do more. Um, I would really, I mean, after eating pizza and drinking beer for five years now, sometimes I'm like, oh, we should just do something completely different. Make I don't know, that, some that crazy beers. And <laughs> 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 we are working on some changes this summer, actually, menu changes. But um, Any of them you can share? Uh, well, this summer will be a big fit food menu change, uh, some small tweaks to the pizza menu. And then um, in the fall, we're going to do a couple. We are going to start playing with side dishes and that kind of thing. And that's food is something that we want to grow because it complements beer. And we really we actually really did not want to get into food. We only wanted to focus on beer and have the the first floor as a tasting bar with a grilled cheese sandwich if you got hungry or a little too drunk. Um, Some pretzels. Yeah, yeah, something just to fill your stomach so you can maybe have another beer. We didn't ever want to open a restaurant. And because we got into the restaurant industry, um, because we opened the basement, um, and we got into pizzas and that kind of thing. Now we're seeing that food is actually a really important complement to beer, and it and showing people that food can be lots of different types of food can be complementary to beer is, I think, really important and part of the future that we want to encourage. We want to encourage tasting menus and help people see, like, oh, a porter is going to go really great with not just a chocolate brownie, but really dark roasted meats. That That's a really good combination. Or a funky sour beer can go um, really amazing with, like, a curry or, you know, something that's equally, that can match that flavor. Yeah, so we want to start playing around. Grilled meat and curry, you really are changing up the menu this summer. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. I don't know if we're going to get that crazy, but um, yeah, baby steps. We're gonna. That's on the agenda as a priority now is to start focusing on food and how we match food with our beers. So I don't know if you or any of the other uh, co-founders had business experience or had opened up a business uh, back in the states, um, but I'm I'm wondering what do you think is unique about opening and running your own small business in in Korea? Maybe an advantage or an obstacle that you just you, you wouldn't face in another country. Yeah, Eric has had a bit of business experience back in Canada. Um, none of us had opened a business in the States that I know of. But I think that just having the business in Korea, there's a lot of differences that I see when I talk, when I read about businesses back home. You know, most of the materials that we reference, Inc. Magazine or um, a lot of content that comes out of, you know, the U.S. or Canada. And I think one thing that's very different is is the relationship between people in Korea. That's something that's really important. Um, in Mac, I believe, is... Yeah, the networking, but it's also how you maintain it because there's that hierarchy, right, of someone is older and perhaps they have more money than you and they've been doing something longer. And if you're the younger person, then how do you respect them That's a pr in an appropriate way and yet still get what you need to get done? I think being foreigners gives us an advantage because we don't necessarily have to adhere to those social structures um, or... Could, could you give an example of that? Like, how, yeah. how does that work in practice? A great example is actually when we were working with Orario to build the brewery. And the owner of Orario wanted to do the outside of the brewery in a certain color. He loves the color red. And all of his buildings are this very br vibrant, bright red. 
our palette is really neutral. <laughs> We're like this minimalist uh, design. I have to say that the lighting, especially in your basement level, is, is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, you oh, know, good. if you walk into a Korean place, it's just like it's brighter than a million suns. Sometimes this, I call this... the basement the dungeon because it, because it's so dark, but it, it it's warming and it's kind of comforting, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, we like a very minimalist uh, look. And so all of our colors are either black, white, or, um, like a, a gray or like a soft blue. That's pretty much our palette. And so a red brewery for us is a huge no-no. Um, if we were young Koreans approaching him and saying, hey, can you help us build this brewery? And can you fund, you know, the land and the buildings and all of this? It would he would have the last say in how it would look because it's his, his building. But because we're foreigners and we don't necessarily have to adhere to that social structure of saying yes, you know, to the older, older person, yes, we should do it your way because we don't have to adhere to that. We put our foot down and we said, you know what, if it's, if it's going to be a red building, then it's an Orario building and we can't put our logo on it. We can't put our name on it. And that's mm-hmm. totally fine. But, you know, then it's not a magpie brewery. It's a brewery that we're leasing from you. Their, their reaction was really, really good with us and they were very open minded about it. And in the end, we came to a conclusion that we were going to paint the brewery black and that worked out really well for us. But I, I, I think that if it had been, if we weren't foreigners, if it wasn't Eric who was negotiating with the owner and saying, you know, like, I really can't do this. I have to, um, we can't put our brand on it. Then that is, that would have been a harder conversation for a young Korean person to have. I think that it would have been almost impossible. Do you think it makes a difference? I mean, you mentioned Eric was negotiating with him. Mm. Um, do you sense that it makes a difference, you know, being a female small business owner compared to a man? I mean, do, do, does Eric, is Eric forced to take the lead? Uh, on these negotiations, particularly with older Korean men, or, or do you find that that's not really a thing? We kind of grew into our position. So I, I always focus mainly on the running of the bar and staffing and in inward uh, looking projects. And Eric had always been focused because he's a little bit more strategic and he loves marketing. He loves creating a product to market. Because he's he was always a little bit more outward focused, he had to deal with Ajashis. And honestly, I think he's a little bit more patient with them than I am. <laughs> so, so that's for the best. That said, when we go to a meeting together, you know, there are a lot of women who own businesses in Korea, and especially Ajamas who run their own restaurant and whatnot. So I don't think it was, it's never like Ajashis were, Korean business guys were a surprise that I was there. But in terms of the conversation, I don't participate as much, and I think it's because the tone is set. It's like it's between Eric and the Ajushi. It's sort of a a male-dominated business in Korea is a male-dominated sphere world. Yeah. I mean, how how do you feel about that? Are there other advantages to not having to be at the forefront of all of this all the time? Um, you can kind of work in the work in the background and, and really focus on the business. Yeah, I mean. Two things. Like I feel, of course, I feel frustrated by it. I think that I'd like to see more women, you know, in the front doing negotiations and leading businesses in Korea. I think that that, that actually is a big focus of a lot of, a lot of women that I know. They have a lot of concerns about feminism in Korea and how women in the workplace are treated and women in leadership roles are treated. Even within our own company, we don't have Currently, we don't have another woman in decision-making roles. So that's something that we're actually trying to proactively recruit for. Um, it's funny to now make HR decisions. Are you saying Magpie, my, uh, <laughs> almost, are you saying Magpie's hiring? Uh, we are. <laughs> <laughs> we are hiring, but, but the next, that is a priority actually. Um, in leadership positions, in manager positions, the next hires have to be women just to start changing the balance of the company. Um, now, in terms of just my personal role and what I'm comf- comfortable with and my strengths are actually focusing inward into our company and how um, operations go, how HR goes. That's something that I'm really driven by. It's a priority for me is to make sure that women in our company and that the way that our company works in general is at its best well, I think it's working. <laughs> I hope so. I tell you, it's a struggle. You know, if you've never had a business before, the hardest part is always people. The hardest part is always figuring out the operations and saying, 
okay, we have, you know, Eric's fantastic at making a product and saying, this is what I want the design to be like. Um, now getting it to market and getting people to drink it um, is a different challenge, but it's something that everybody talks about, right? Like when you read business blogs and business books, they're always like, how do you make your customer appreciate? How do you, how do you engage them? How do you, um, uh, how do you market to them? But when you look at operations and HR and how do you make the company run, that's always a little bit more tricky. And the books are a little bit more boring. <laughs> right. You know, there's not as many people talking about that. How do you make HR policies humane? You know, if someone has an accident and you can only give them two day or two weeks of sick leave, but they really need a month of recovery and you don't want to lose them. Like, how do you balance that with your checkbook? So, What kind of workplace are you trying to create for employees at Magpie? Um, it's tricky because, like we talked about a little bit uh, with the Korean culture. So for me, I would love to have something like a Patagonia, Google, where it's very liberal and free and you make your own work schedule. Horizontal and, and yeah. Yeah, right, right. like that sounds uh, amazing and ideal. That said, you do need some hierarchy in it. You need a manager who's going to say, who's going to enforce deadlines and make sure things are going to get done. And Korean culture has that hierarchy built into it. So even if we try to make things horizontal, for example, we don't have titles. We, everybody uses the first names. And that was a hard adjustment for some people, especially when we bring in someone who's older, they're going to start using Tim Jang Nim or like a, a title with them, even though it wasn't assigned. And so you have to constantly be reinforcing, oh, no, I'm going to use your first name for this. You should use um, so-and-so's first name and make sure that it has an equal feeling to it so that the hierarchy that is in Korean language and culture doesn't influence too much of our company culture. That's That's something that's it's a subtle priority, but it's it exists. You know, it's like the wallpaper of a room. Not something I would see as a customer, but behind right. the counter, it's something that it's... Right, exactly, yeah. What is the relationship between Magpie and other microbreweries? Um, we, we mentioned at the beginning of the show, you have some policy shifts that have really led to an explosion um, of craft beer and, and, and restaurants that are similar in structure uh, and, and design to yours. So... Yeah, I guess I want to know how is Magpie's relationship with competitors, um, and how is the scene in general? Is it is it really cutthroat? I mean, are we going to get a whole? Are we going to get flooded with bots that are like you know? <laughs> we're going to get docs because I'm I'm interviewing Magpie from uh, from another one, or <laughs> is 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 it actually quite quite a, quite a friendly uh, kind of industry? I would say it's friendly. It's it's too small to be competitive, you know. Right now, I think the craft beer market in the States is 10 to 15% of the overall beer market. And in Korea, it's 1%, less than 1%. Um, so we still have a lot of growing to do. It's not saturated enough to be competitive. Also, the craft beer community that we've seen in the U.S. is a friendly community. You work together because you want to convert you want to help each other because you're converting more people to craft beer. You know, we all know each other because it's such a small community. Um, we help each other if we're out of an ingredient and we need to borrow some from another brewery or some, or we want to do a collaboration brew. People are very, very easy to work with. And Korea is a really competitive culture and society. And sometimes you get that feeling that, you know, everybody wants to be number one, and they're focusing on that as opposed to building the community and converting more beer drinkers to craft beer lovers. Yeah, so that, you know, sometimes that comes up and you see that with competitions or that kind of thing. But in general, on on the whole, I think it's a really, beer drinkers in general tend to be pretty laid back and friendly. Uh, how are you distinguishing yourself from these other establishments? You know, f when we first started, we we did not focus on marketing at all. We didn't put any money towards it. We want we simply wanted to focus on talking directly with the customer and hopefully expanding distribution as soon as bars started putting in refrigerators and that kind of thing. Now that the craft beer market has been growing, bars are asking for our beers and other craft breweries, and you have a little bit more educated customer who has maybe tried. Gal Maggie, Wild Waves, Hand and Mall, you know, they, they know all these, all these breweries. One priority for us is to make sure that we stay in the conversation. We don't necessarily have to be the best brewery, known as the best brewery in Korea. That's not a priority for us, but we want to make sure that we're in the conversation and people are talking about, talking about us. 
I think the the way that we are doing that is by making new beers and making sure that we're staying relevant with beer trends and that we're making stuff that's new and fresh and I think creative. Yeah, you know, we just came out with a raspberry Berliner Weiss and a ginger beer and um we have a couple couple of new seasonals lined up for the fall, so just to make sure that we're changing our product that we're changing our product and that we're making that we're making something new that the customer is going to want to drink. Um, every season is, is really important for us. Yeah. We still don't focus too much on advertising or paying for, paying for ads or that kind of thing. It's just not our style. We prefer more of a grassroots, I guess, sort of movement. Mm -hmm. But, um, even that as we grow, we're going to have to start looking at how do we change our marketing and reach out to people. Anyone who visits Noaks Up Young now would be really surprised to learn that just 10, 15 years ago, um, it, it was, it, it was really, quite different. Um, it was kind of a sleepy residential area. Uh, you had a few marts and, you know, how many Sunday Jeeps. Yeah, but I mean, four years ago. Even four <laughs> years ago. Right, right. So, yeah. you know, I, I think that Nook Sapyung is a really good example of the kind of rapid gentrification that is taking over uh, many parts of Seoul. Uh, Yeonamdong is another area where, you know, every time you go there, there's a new building that's being torn down mm -hmm. or renovated for a, you know, a fancy Italian place or a Mexican place or what have you. And so I, I'm wondering, you know, how does Magpie approach the gentrification issue? I mean, I mean, certainly you were taking the place of an elderly Korean couple. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're ready to sell. Maybe it was, it was totally friendly. You're still there. And that is driving up the cost for everybody yeah. living there. Uh, what is your take on that? And how do you approach that issue? I mean, there's a lot of focus on that now. I know the new president has been talking about it. There's we're actually um, a couple of our neighbors are, for, are forming a coalition to help put pressure on the government to change gentrification laws, specifically to change laws uh, relating to landlords and renters. And we're part of that. Um, we're supporting them. Gentrification is a funny word because I think there's a couple different levels of it. We are definitely part of that gentrification process. Every neighborhood that Except for Hongdae, I think. Hongdae has always been sort of on the wild side. But Itaewon, definitely, it went from being an older an older neighborhood that wasn't very interesting to interesting to young, young Korean people. When we came in and started, um, you know, becoming popular, our popularity caused landlords to start increasing the rent and other places, other restaurants to start opening in that neighborhood. And it changed the face of the neighborhood. I think some people would say for the better because it added more uh, life to it and it brought more money to the neighborhood. But it's now reached a tipping point where you have corporate names coming and looking at, you know, can we open a Starbucks down the street? Or, you know, now there's a coffee smith just, just up the block from us. So there's, those three stages are really tricky to say like, okay, well, this is a good stage that brings money and attention versus this is now we've gone to corporate and we've lost our soul. Philosophically, we don't like gentrification to the point where corporate names are coming in. And like we are an independent business. We, we like having a community that where I know, you know, the business owners names who are down the block from me and we can build that kind of relationship. We're against the gentrification of a neighborhood to a point where it, it loses its face. It loses its, its purpose in providing to community members. I think we, want to support small businesses, independent business, not necessarily small, but independent businesses who are catering to people living in that community and not just creating trend zones where you have, you know, Korean tourists from all over Seoul coming just to eat the it item or drink the it thing. Yeah, that that kind of gentrification, which I think is the far end of gentrification, is too much, and I don't think that it's good, and we never want to be part of that. Unfortunately, we've become part of that in Itaewon because that's what's happened in Gyeongnidan, I think. People will buy a churros or an ice cream and then walk around and take photos, and it doesn't really contribute to the community's well-being and uh, prosperity, I think. Originally, our intent was just to make a business because... You know, it, it was a neighborhood that felt like it was dying and it seemed like a great place to come in and make a little spot for us, for our friends. We have that interest in so far in all the neighborhoods that we've been moving into. In Jeju, Tapdong was an old neighborhood. Um, it used to be the old city hall and then the city hall moved further inland. And so that neighborhood had been dying for a while and Arario really 
bought a couple buildings there because it was a good investment, like 15 years ago. And we said, yes, we love, we love, you know, older neighborhoods because they have so much personality and you have people who have lived there for so long and care about the neighborhood. Um, so that's the kind of place that we want to go into. We don't look for spots that are the hot, trendy spots where a million people are walking by, but they're not emotionally invested in, oh, you know, in seeing a restaurant come in that they would like to eat at every day or every week or where do you see Magpie going uh, in the near, medium, and long-term future? Uh, to the moon. No. <laughs> Magpie um, Brewery on the far side of the moon. That sounds great. Logistics um, might be a little bit more complicated yeah, than Jeju. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, we are definitely definitely trying to position ourselves to grow. Um, we want to ship internationally. I think Asia will be the first place to focus. So, um, this year we'll be sending beer to Hong Kong, which is really exciting. We all of your beers, just just one or two. No, just a few core beers. So the pale, um, pale IPA, maybe the porter, uh, maybe the ghost, actually the gosa. So just a handful of core beers to Hong Kong, and we'll see how that goes. We also need to expand our brewery size, so we're looking at making a bigger brewery up near the Seoul area. Once we can expand the brewery size, then, you know, we'll look at growing uh, internationally more and more. I think that Korean craft beer market is expanding and it will continue expanding a lot over the next five years, I think. But for me, because, you know, we're international and because, because I still keep tabs with what's going up, what's going on back home, I'd love to see Magpie in the States and have friends be able to drink it. That is a long way off. <laughs> the U.S. is the mecca for craft beer, and so it will be a while, I think, before we send our beer there. So, well, so why why is it if the craft brew scene is so big in the United States, and there's clearly a, a big market for it, why is that more difficult to send your beer there than it is to Hong Kong? I mean, it maybe is an emotional thing. It's because you are setting your product right. You're setting your beer next to a beer that you revere as the best beer you know or so for example like sierra nevada is is one of the beers that i remember i started drinking that turned me into a craft beer lover one of the beers that the pale ale is something that we really wanted to replicate or make a beer like that and so to set your beer set a magpie pale ale next to that sometimes it just feels like that's it just it seems so much bigger, you know. In the U.S., you're you're talking about breweries that are that are world famous and that are amazing. And um, I think that we still we've got really good beers, and I'm really proud of our beers. But um, it feels a little bit like jumping into the big leagues or swimming in the ocean when you've been in a little pond for so long. Yeah, I think that we we will like to do a couple competitions, um, international competitions first, and just sort of dip our toe in and see what the international response is and um, and whatnot. But you also have customers in the U.S. who know a lot more and have a lot more points of comparison. I mean, I don't doubt our product at all, but it's just a little bit more intimidating, and we want right. to make sure, like, okay, we are absolutely ready. This is the best beer that we're sending over, and um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas Hong Kong, the Asian market, you don't have as many points of comparison, and I think the customer is a little bit more forgiving, and you have an opportunity to educate them about your product a little bit more. Yeah. Right. The advantage we have in the U.S., though, is that we are a Korean brewery, and that is a bit exotic because right. I don't think that there are – I think the booth is is uh, over there, but I'm not sure if any other Korean breweries are. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, you can definitely capitalize, I think, on that on that exoticism, almost a bit of a, a bit of a novelty. Yeah. I, mean, I don't want to say Orientalism. It's maybe not so PC, but it, that, that certainly is a, is a factor, right? You know, yeah. beer from the Far East. Yeah. You know. I mean, we've had people ask. Um, we've already had distributors from Washington and um, California ask for our beer. It's because also Korean, cult, like Korean culture, Korean food is very hot um, and becoming more and more mainstream. So people want... Okay, let's get a Korean, a great Korean beer to come with, come over and do this with us, you know, like complement the product mm -hmm. or complement the food. Okay, towards the end of the podcast, we're getting into our rapid fire section. Tiffany, have you ever launched a beer that just completely failed and nobody bought and everybody hated? 
There was actually a beer that we called the Fail Ale um, because, well, that was <laughs> but people crusty, people huh? still bought it, and I actually still have customers. I have a couple of British customers who really really liked it and sometimes ask for it. But it it was called the Fail Ale because um, Kabu had made a beer and they had altered the recipe or done something in the process that made it not taste like our pale ales. It honestly tasted like. It didn't have an infection, but maybe it fermented too too high, or it had an off flavor. We hated it. We wanted to dump it, but at the time we didn't have another. We only had like pale ale on, and we can't just be serving, you know, water. <laughs> so, so we were um, we had fail ale. Yeah, that was something that a lot of people were like, "What is this?" Um, but again, there were some customers who really loved it. Yeah, I don't think we've had anything that that really was rejected by everybody. We have a beer right now that called the Einbeck or I'm 100 uh, to celebrate the 100th brew at the new brewery, and it's a sour stout. It's pretty. It's really excellent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I gotta say, I I you know I like it, but it's it's definitely something that a new customer is not going to dive right into. Um, it's something that if you're a beer lover and you really like sours, then you're going to enjoy that. So I think that's the one that gets the funniest expression from everybody now. Um, when they try it, they're, you know, they either really love it, but most people are, ooh, that's, that's a weird one. You know, they, they don't, they're not going to drink a pint of it on their first try. Yeah. What is the hardest beer to brew? Um, we just did a raspberry Berliner Weiss and that was hard because you need the lactobacillus in it. We also brew a Gosa that, that beer takes the longest time, um, because you do the brew, you do a mash, um, and then you have to let the mash sit to inoculate the lactobacillus in it. And then you boil and move on with the rest of the brew and that takes an extra day. So that takes the most time and, um, I think also the most consideration because you just have to pay attention to it's not just yeast fermenting out of beer it's another agent in there to contribute to the flavors and we've had ghosts gozas that were way too sour and gozas that didn't have enough sourness and it just has to do with monitoring that that extra bacteria in there were sours one of the original they weren't one of the original launch no lines. we we launched with just the pale ale and served that alone for about six months and then and then we added the porter, and we just had the two on, and then slowly added added more beers. Was you know similar to these other beers? Was sours? Was that just something that you guys really liked? Where did you get the inspiration for that? You know, the craft beer trend has been really hoppy IPAs, sours, and now it's going to, and then it went to like barrel aging, and now it's there's these New England IPAs. We've sort of followed along with that because as the new beers, these new styles come out, well, they're not new styles, but as they become more popular, you just see a wider variety of them and it kind of sparks your creativity. So when we go home and we can taste a sour beer aged in bourbon barrels with, you know, apricots or something like that, it just blows your mind and we get really inspired and we want to make something similar. So we started dabbling in sours and um, one of the things that we're going to do hopefully by the end of the year is get some barrels and start barrel aging things. Yeah, I think sours and dealing with the funky bugs, you know, different bacteria is a lot more fun. And it adds some complexity and some uh, different flavors to everything. Right. Yeah. Have you thought about going into hard liquors? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, a brewery is just one step beyond a, a whiskey <laughs> distillery, I think. Would that add any, so, like, layer of complexity to the licensing or anything like that? I think so. Yeah. Um, we would probably need some, a license for a distillery, but I'm not sure about how to get that. Yeah. That said, I think we'd also probably need to upgrade our space. We don't have enough space for, to input a distillery in, but it's definitely on the timeline. That's, that's the next project. How did you guys think of the name Magpie? Yeah, that was actually suggested by a friend of ours. Um, we were, we wanted something that was local and we toyed around with like Yongsan Brewing Company or Itaewon Brewing Company, but nothing really, nothing really sounded right. A Korean friend of ours suggested the magpie because it's one of the only non-migratory birds in Korea. And back in the day, back when people used to live in um, smaller villages, you'd have a family of magpie that would also magpies that would also live with them. And if a new visitor was coming to the village, the magpies would call because they knew that this was a stranger coming. And so magpies became symbols of good luck or good visitors or good news that were coming. As foreigners to Korea, we 
we really liked that and we want to be known as a good visitor, hopefully bringing good luck or good news to Korea. We plan on staying for a really long time, so it was a bird and an icon that fit us um, and that we identified with. So, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. If you could describe uh, working at Magpie in one word, what would that word be? I would say creative. I would say because because we're a small company, because we're a fairly new company, and because we don't want to do things by the book, and we want to, we everybody's always asking questions of like, do we should we really be doing it this way? Should we be building a different system? I I would say that we're a creative company. I think people are constantly trying to think outside the box and do new things and create new systems. You know, there of course like. Every company needs certain SOPs like that just make the make the business function, but we have the luxury of taking the time and looking at those systems and saying, okay, does this actually fit philo- our philosophy? One of the things that I'm that we're working on now a lot is our HR policies. Um and I mentioned this a little bit before of, you know, how do you make HR policies more humane so that you can retain staff that they can integrate their life with work um, a little bit more completely. And it doesn't mean that we want everybody to be a workaholic and stay at Magpie for, you know, until 9 p.m. Well, you are a Korean company, so that would be <laughs> that totally, would... <laughs> totally accepted. That's true. Well, not Maybe not accepted, but expected. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but we don't, yeah, we don't want that. So, you know, people are allowed to bring dogs to work. I'm actually pregnant now, and so we're trying to figure out, okay, how does... Congratulations. Thank you. Um, how does maternity leave work? How does childcare work? You know, what do parents need to be able to work with us, uh, work full time, but also make sure that they're, you know, that they're active in their kids' lives. Our communities are important. Our people are important. Um, and the culture that we promote that we want to take part in is important. How do we, how do we reflect, reflect that in the company? Are there any beer stereotypes associated with your customers? There aren't a lot of beer stereotypes because you, because most people will drink soju. And beer is, if you're not, if you really can't drink soju or as a soju chaser, as a bomb shot to go with, you know, soju. So I haven't seen a lot of beer stereotypes that uh, make it predictable to know who's going to be drinking what. I remember a point when we first got Porter and I was standing in the brew shop and I looked around and it was, you know, the shop was full of Korean women all drinking porters. And I was shocked because like in the States, most women will prefer wine or a lighter beer and they don't want the darker beer because there's the idea that dark beers are heavier and they're going to fill you up and, um, and they have more calories. So it really blew my mind to see how, how Korean women love dark beers and they're open to it. And there is no, uh, preconception there is no preconception of what a beer you know who should be drinking a beer that said i think a lot of ajishis are drinking ipas <laughs> which is right. so are so are like young you know young white foreigner guys are like coming in and they drink they want to drink the hoppy you know, what's the hoppiest thing that you have on tap or what's the strongest alcohol that you have on tap but we have a lot of um older ajishis who drink ipas i think because it's a trendy thing right now and then they might switch to the kolsch which is a lighter beer more similar to a pale lager um i've noticed that a lot of women do like the darker beers because they have rich flavors like coffee and chocolate and then if a person is not if a person doesn't really like heavier bodied or medium bodied beers, then they'll stick to the ghost. So most people who are wine drinkers will prefer to have a sour beer because it's a little bit lighter. It has a little bit more complexity like a white wine. Have you ever experienced any pushback from the entrenched uh, beer players here in South Korea? Or have you actually been able to influence kind of the mainstream beer market in ways that you didn't anticipate? I think we're still too small to experience any pushback, and I haven't seen any pushback, or we haven't felt any pushback. That said, we've noticed that uh, the bigger players are, they're changing their marketing, or they're they are upgrading their beer marketing. Um, they're also trying to expand beer lines. And so, um, for example, I remember when Queen's Ale came out, and that was supposed to be the big brewery version of like a pale ale. Um, it didn't taste anything like a pale ale. Yeah, you're starting to see not just lagers, but you're starting to see other pale ales or um, beers available. So I think I think that the bigger players are starting to notice that 
they can't just use the same line over and over with their marketing of like, ah, Cass, you know, like it's delicious. That's that doesn't cut it anymore. So step A, yeah, <laughs> choose a hot celebrity. Right. <laughs> step B, take a picture of said hot celebrity drinking your beer. Right. Step three, <sighs> exactly like that. That doesn't really cut it anymore. So they're trying to they're trying to change like some of their marketing. And you'll see things like, um, oh, what is it? Original gravity is like a, a tagline and it doesn't actually mean really anything. It original gravity is like when you make a beer, it's the starting gravity of the beer and then you measure it. It's a measurement for alcohol, how to measure the alcohol, but it doesn't mean anything to the customer because they don't know anything about it. And if you just put that on canned. So anyway, they're trying these new marketing techniques and then they're also trying to diversify their product a little bit by adding maybe a pale ale. But the it's great pale, for, the, for the consumers. Yeah, it's great for the consumers because it also is starting to open their minds a little bit of like, oh, there are lots of alternatives and it doesn't just apply to the one craft beer bar that's down the street. This is a bigger movement. If anything, we're starting to see them see them recognize that consumers are interested in different types of beer and they're not going to fall for the same marketing over and over. I think one way that we do see pushback is that there's a law that's supposed to pass this year that allows smaller breweries to sell packaged goods to um, peony jams like uh, supermarkets. Um, so like like canned magpie beers. Yeah, exactly. So if we can, we can only sell those in our locations currently. But by the end of, end of this year, there should be a law that allows us to sell to e-mart, any um, type of convenience store. Um, yeah, I think there has been a lot of pushback with that and bigger breweries don't want that to happen because then, of course, if you have like a small mart owner or a peony gem owner, then they will have a lot uh, a lot more selection to choose from and they'll, you know, want to hopefully... I mean, Uri Supa right next door, exactly. you kind of have this symbi- symbiotic relationship yeah. Between them, it seems like where where the customers just kind of blend together, yeah. Right, and then you'll you know you'll see a friend that's sitting over at Magpie, and you know they'll, they'll kind of join tables, and then they'll be yelling at each other. Yeah, and, it's know. fantastic because like so, so that that convenience store though has lots of brews that you mm-hmm. can't find anywhere else. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, so it's a great is that blend. Like illegal, what they're doing? Then? No, those are all imported. So import and micro brews are fine. Yes. You can yes. sell those at Peony Jams, Emarts. It doesn't yes. matter. But locally made craft brews, yes. it's illegal to, for Peony Jams to sell those. Yes, yes, they can't sell those. And so, so you'll see. I think um, Hand and Malt has an apple cider because apple cider doesn't fall under the beer category. Um, and you'll see though that at Woody Super, and then you'll also see um, the booth has has one of their beers in there because it was. They actually brew that beer outside the U.S., outside of Korea and import it. Yeah. So the only way to get around that is like if you're going to contract brew in the States or if you have a brewery outside of Korea and then import it, then you can serve it. You can sell it to, yeah, Korean penny jams and marts and e-marts and that kind of thing, which is really frustrating. But, um, but right. uh, you know, it's the big guys also when when is that law supposed to go by the end of this year okay i think it's i think it's been approved and it just needs to go into action by the end of this year but there is a lot of pushback from it about it yeah so I, well i see. i think i know what you guys need to do you need to find the hottest korean celebrity you can <laughs> incorporate him or her into your marketing that's you know well i'll take that into consideration <laughs> <laughs> What do Magpie employees drink? A lot of people like the Ghost. Uh, a lot of people like um, the Kolsch. I think everybody's been drinking pale ale for so long that they don't drink much pale ale. And IPA. IPA is always a favorite. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every time somebody goes abroad, they have to bring back beer. And so we do tastings every month and um, we talk about the different styles and the differences. We do taste comparisons between our beer and other other companies' beers like we just did. Um, our Pale Ale versus Dale's Pale Ale and um, – but another uh, another Pale Ale. And it's great to do those side-by-side comparisons and it gives people more exposure to – our staff more exposure because a lot of them haven't had beers outside of Korea. You know, they haven't been able to go to – San Francisco or San Diego and try like the huge selection of beers there. They know what's available in Korea. Mm-hmm. So we always try to bring beers in and do tastings and get them to drink as many different styles as possible. So let's say I'm a foreigner here and been here a couple of years looking for long-term options that are not teaching at a Hagwon. 
and I decide, you know, I like beer. I think I could do this. What would you say to that person who's looking to start their own, their own uh, brewery? craft brewery? Yes. That's a great question. Um, I would say it's really hard. <laughs> um, like, number one. Don't I, do it. No. <laughs> it's hard. It's so hard. I think if you um, if you don't have the funding to buy equipment, get a five year at least a five year lease or ten year lease on a space, you have to buy uh, at least a year's worth of ingredients, labor because you don't want to be working seven days a week. Um, if you don't have the funding for all that upfront costs, look at contract brewing. Um, it's a really really great option to get your foot in the door and make you realize. Oh, there's the pool is deeper than I thought it was. It will also get you integrated into the brewery community here, and people will help you um, once you get started. If you don't have the opportunity to start contract brewing, then try to work at a brewery um, because I think a lot of people don't they love beer and they don't realize what actually goes into running a factory and a company and a brand. Those are all aspects that are really important and um, I think downplayed in um, the craft beer uh, business because people focus so much on their love for craft beer, which is which is fantastic and you need that to begin with. You need that to drive everything else. But there's so much more to having – to opening a brewery means opening a business and there's so much more to that. Um, so I would say just work for a brewery and make sure, make sure that you, this is something that you want to get into. You know, running a factory is totally different from home brewing. That's something that we've realized really early on, thankfully, that we simply don't have that expertise of sanitation, um, oxidation, like all, all these little things that go into making a beer great over and over and over again. It requires expertise as well as the business end of it, the financials, the branding of it. There's so much that goes into it. So mm -hmm. um, just make sure before you dive in. And if you are absolutely positive, then I would say start contract brewing and start talking to people because you're going to need um, funding and investment um, to get started. You know, that's one of the challenges for small businesses is you get rolling. Funding, funding, you know, funding, funding. You get rolling and then you need to grow to keep up and uh, and then you run into cash flow problems and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. If anything, I think that's actually something that the Korean government should also pay attention to because there isn't a lot of funding for small businesses um, owned by foreigners. Last question. If you had unlimited capital and had to open up a business that was not related to brewing... What company would you open? I don't know. Beer is so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot do that. Unlimited capital, unlimited resources. Um, oh, and anything good, else. That's a good question too. Yeah, I don't <laughs> – it's funny. My hobbies outside of Magpie – so Magpie is like all-consuming for me and Eric because, you know, it's it's our baby. It's, it's everything. Um, like, you know, most – business owners, I think your business becomes your life. Um, my hobbies right now or the things that I'm interested in right now are the food, um, farming and, um, maybe getting into, uh, meats and, uh, dried meats and that kind of thing. Um, milk and cheeses. I really, really would love to explore making cheeses. Yeah. So something, something a little bit more with food, whether it be, um, I was going to say an estate brewery. <laughs> Because <laughs> in a state brewery, Magpie, the farm, wine, and cheeses, I guess. Yeah, yeah. A lateral move. Yeah, yeah. like I think, um, I think, I think doing something with dried meats, cheeses, like that kind of, that would be really, really cool. Um, or dog training. I really love dog training. <laughs> Just throw that in there. Dog training, sure. <laughs> it's so satisfying. Dog training. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So in case anybody doesn't know, uh, where can we find Magpie? We have three locations. So Itaewon um, or Gyeongnidan location, Hongdae, which is right beside the park and the big gate of Hongik University, and then in Jeju, our Tapdong location. Our brewery is also in Jeju, and um, it's in Huichandong, and we have a small tap room there, so you can also try the beers there. We are growing distribution, um, but I don't have a list of bars off the top of my head. I would say if you want more information, check out our Facebook page, um, which is just the Facebook.com Magpie Brewing. 
and um, our website. Yeah. Which is? Magpiebrewing.com. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Tiffany. Thank you so much.